So tonight I want to talk to you about the greatest chapter, just for a couple of minutes. I believe in the Bible. It's Romans chapter 8. I started to talk to you about this two weeks ago, do y'all remember? And y'all just praised and brought the presence down and I, I felt like I couldn't talk that night. So, <laughs> so how many of you believe that we are more? How many of you think that we need to renew our minds and really get the revelation that I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus? So tonight I want to talk about why you're more. I want to think about the question because in verse 36 in Romans chapter 8, the Bible says, for your sake... For your sake, you are slayed all the day long. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't feel like being slayed today. But he says, for your sake, you are being slayed all the day long. You are looked upon like a sheep to the slaughter. My next question is, is why? Why? Is it so good for you to get butchered, slayed every day? It keeps us in line. Lord, is there any other way to keep me in line (laughs) other than killing me, (laughs) slaying me like a sheep to the slaughter? And then you say, Lord, that Not only is it happening to me, you're saying it's good for me. You're saying it's for my sake. I mean, you know, we sometimes don't know what's good for us and what's what's not good for us, right? Because if the Lord is saying that it's for your sake, I minister destiny. (laughs) I see you meditating, girl. (laughs) Well, I don't know what to think about it. So... Here's where we're going to start tonight. We'll start in verse 26, and here's what the Scripture says. And we'll just read some Scripture tonight and talk about it. Is that all right? And I need help from all of you guys. So I don't want this to be a one-sided thing. I want to hear from you. So the Bible says, likewise, the Spirit. Now, what Spirit is that? How do you know that's the Holy Spirit? That's the Spirit of God. So what Spirits are in the world then? Is there a spirit of, spirit of man? Yes. Is man a spirit? Yes. Is there a demon spirit? Yes. Is there angel spirits? Yes. And is there a Holy Ghost spirit? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Good. Likewise, the Holy Ghost spirit also helps our infirmities or our weaknesses. How many of you know that sometimes we're weak and we need some Holy Ghost help? For we know not what we should pray all the time with our understanding as we ought, right? But who knows how to pray? But the Holy Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now let me think about that for just a second. So sometimes I don't know how to pray with my understanding, right? But I am more. You know why I'm more? Because there's something to me more than just me. I'm more because the Holy Ghost lives in me. I'm more because I got the mind of God. That knows the heart of God, the mind of God, the perfect will of God. And when I don't know the direction I need to go in, when I don't understand what's really going on around me, I got a helper. I got a, uh, I I got a standby. I got a strengthener. I got an advocate. I got an intercessor that lives in me. I got a comforter. I got a helper. I got the Holy Ghost. I am more because he who is more lives in me. Greater is he who lives in me 
than he, the devil that lives in the world. Great. The greater one lives on the inside of me. I don't know about you, but I feel like shouting right now. So here's what he does. When I don't know how to pray, when I am weak, when there's an infirmity in my life, my agent, my manager, my advocate, my help, my provider, my teacher, my comforter, my counselor, the spirit of truth lives in me. Wait a minute. I am more because the Holy Spirit lives in me. And he knows the perfect will of God. Every time he prays through me and in me, it never misses God's purpose for my life. It never misses God's direction for my life. It always deals with whatever situation. I'm going to say it like that. Whatever circumstance in my life, the greater one. Listen, I am more because God and the Holy Ghost lives on the inside of me. And God is praying in me and through me. God is working this thing. God is doing this thing in me. This thing is more than me. Because look at your neighbor and say, I am more. I am more. Now, are we arrogant? Are we saying we're more because some kind of way I'm better than somebody else? I'm more because I have God in me. Man, I'm privileged. I have God in me. And he that searches the hearts, he knows what is the mind of the spirit. By the way, if you look at do a word study on who searches the heart in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. There's scripture for all three of them that search your heart. I mean, you know, Jesus is searching your heart. And he knows what the mind of the spirit is. Because he makes intercession For the saints, according to what? So let me ask you something. Will the Holy Spirit ever misappropriate prayer? Will he ever miss God? Absolutely not. So now God is living in us and through us. I am more. And verse 28 says, and we know that all things, what? Work together for who's good? For our good, right? To those that love God and who are called according to his purpose. So I am more because all things are going to work for my good. Wait, God's going to work it out for my good. How about the great God of heaven and earth working every detail of your life out, no matter whether it's good or bad, and he's working it for your good. Some kind of way it's going to work for your good because God is in it. Hey, God can turn a bad thing into a good thing. That's what he does. He's God. Somebody said, well, how does he do it? I don't know how he does everything that he does. But I just know that with God, all things work together for my good. I just know it's going to work out for my good. Verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he did what? He predestinated you to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. I want to leave it on the scripture for a second because I want to think about this. So he predestinates you, he calls you, he justifies you, and then he glorifies you. I am more because God foreknew me. Somebody said, all right, so he foreknew me, then he called me, then he predestinated me, then he justified me, and then he glorified me. What in the heck? What did you do? So in God's mind, before I was, God saw me. God foreknew me. 
Aren't you glad that he knew you before you were you? Then he says he called you. You know, it's good when the Lord puts a calling on your life. He calls you to a purpose. Then he predestinated you to be the image of his dear son. I thought about predestination. Did that mean that God predestinated some people to go to hell and some people to go to heaven and you had no say in the matter? God foreknew you, he called you, he predestinated you, and whatever side he called you to, heaven or hell, that is your lot. Does that mean that? Oh, he predestined us all to serve him. But we have a choice as a free mortal agent. So could you give me a scripture that would really prove that you have a free will and that you have a choice to go to heaven or hell and it's really up to you? John 3.16, for God so... God... For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe believe in him should not perish but have... So so God sent his son to save the world, right? But somebody's got to believe in him. What happens if you don't believe? You'd be damned. (laughs) Oh, uh, 2 Peter 3, 9. God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come under the knowledge of repentance. So it's not God's will that any go to hell. I got another scripture. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. He says, Behold, I place before you life and death, blessing and curse. Watch this. Choose ye life that you might live. So let me ask something. If God put life and death before you, blessing and curse, and then tells you you got a choice. You know what I've always said? I've always said that the devil has had a plan for your life. A predestinated plan for your life. And God has had a predestinated plan for your life. You get to choose who you want to serve. Who's going to be your master? Because no man lives unto himself. You're either going to serve God or you're going to serve the devil. Somebody said devil and then that means Satan, that old dragon, that old serpent, that slew foot. So moreover, who he foreknew... I mean, no, you're foreknown in God. Aren't you glad? And who he foreknew, he called. Aren't you? I am more because I'm called by God. And whom he called, he predestinated to become the image of his son. He wants you to look just like Jesus. That's why God took upon himself flesh and became a man, the God man, walked amongst us so that we could see God in the physical. And now God wants us to look just like what he looked like when he walked in the flesh. That's what it means to become predestined to the image of his dear son, Jesus Christ. How many of you know God wants us all to look just like Jesus? And how many know the devil hates every one of us because every one of us is the image of God. And every time you get married, it reminds the devil of God's relationship with his people. So he hates your marriage. That's why he has such warfare in your marriage. Because he's trying to destroy the image of God in you. That's why he hates human beings and he hates marriage. That's why you're always under attack. 
But then he said that all things will work for your good. So the attack is actually working for your good. Shout somebody. The next thing he said was, was you're foreknown, you're called, you're predestinated. And then he says you're justified. And he says glorified. Let's take, let's look at justified. Justified means that you are made righteous. Here's what it means. That when you make Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of your life, then you take a position as a son. In fact, a little earlier in the scripture says you're adopted. Adopted means you get all the rights of whoever adopted you. You get an inheritance. You're an heir. So all that God is, you are because you inherit everything that God is, is yours as, as in sonship. That means that you're justified. Justified means that you're in right standing with God, that you're made righteous in the sight of God. Your position as a son of God, you're in right standing with God. You have a position with God as a son and an heir of God. You are a child of God. Don't start shouting yet. Because early, who was here when early was preaching? That my father in the faith. Early said that righteousness, he says, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteous peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Y'all remember that? That was his text scripture. He said that righteousness not only means that you're in right standing with God, man, and I feel like shouting just being right with God. That makes me shout. But he says you received an endowment. The endowment is is that he gives you the power. The blessedness of God is the authority and the power that God has endowed within you to be anything that you want to be. Your righteousness empowers you to be anything that you want to be. So the scripture says, not only did he foreknow you, not only did he what? Wait, there's one before that he called you. So he foreknew you, he called you, he predestinated you, he justified you and made you righteous. And next he says, and I glorified you. What in the heck does glorified mean, Lord? Glorification. Man, I don't know about y'all. This is the greatest chapter in the whole Bible. This tells you who you are. This tells you what God has done in your life. Listen to what he did for you. He glorified you. Glorification is a resurrection. It's a lifting you up. In other words, God found you in your mire, in the miry clay, in the horrible pit of sin. You were down. Your head was down. And he reached down and grabbed you out of that muck and that mire. You were nasty. Gene Mills said you were stepping in the soft mud on the dairy farm. You had the soft mud on you. (laughs) And the Bible says that the Lord reached down, way down. By the way, the further you're down, the greater the resurrection. (laughs) And the Bible says that then he glorified you. He reached, he grabbed you, and he lifted you up. (laughs) He glorified you. One more time. You are more because he foreknew you. He called you. He predestinated you. He justified you. And he glorified you. Man. Y'all ready to go home? (laughs) No, y'all know. What shall we then say then to all of these things? If God be who? who? So if 
if God be for us, then who in the heck could be against us? If God did all of these things for us, then how could we be mully grubbing around? How could we have the wrong stinking thinking in our life? How could we think that God is not for us and God is not with us and God is not there to help us? How could we possibly, if God lives on the inside praying for you? Look, not only is the Holy Ghost in you praying for you, Jesus is in heaven at the right hand of God praying for you too. Man, I'm telling you, double for your trouble, devil. Hallelujah. <laughs> so you got God in earth in you praying for you and God in heaven praying for you. You can't lose with the stuff we use. And then he breaks it down. He said, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. In other words, if God took his most prized possession and didn't spare him for you, gave him up for you. If God did that for you, How shall he not with him, in him, through him, not freely give you all things? In other words, I'm more because God freely gives me things. If he gave his his son, Jesus. Let me ask you something. How many of you got a son? All right, I need you to sacrifice him for me. Can you do that? Where's y'all's hands? Oh, don't get real spiritual on me in here. As soon as I get the cross out and the nails and the hammer, you take it off. You took your son and took off running. I know one thing. I ain't putting no nails in none of my kids for y'all. Y'all love to turn you back on me. Y'all, know, y'all love to. Uh, I, I done did everything in the world for you to save you and gave my best for you, and then you stick a knife in my back and start talking about me. What? And then you don't even want to serve God anymore because you, you got your feelings hurt. Somebody said something crazy to you at church. Yep. Somebody said something cute to you, rubbed up against you and hurt your little feelings. And I done gave my son for you and you done lost your mind. (laughs) So who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Let me ask you something. Are you God's elect? Yes. 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 Did you win the election? God is all by himself voting. He voted for you. Thank you, Lord. God is a majority all by himself. How many of you believe that? Yeah. And, and he voted for you and you got elected. Wait, he foreknew you. He called you. He predestinated you. He justified. He glorified you. And then he sent his own son. He spared not his own son for you. And how much more through him shall he not freely give you everything? He already gave you everything. Gave you Jesus. And who shall lay anything to the charge of God's special chosen people? If God is for you, who in the world can come against you? Who is stronger than God? Who's bigger than God? Who's going to argue with God tonight? Wait, there's a, uh, there's a boxing ring. Who's going to get into the ring and box God tonight? <laughs> Just go ahead and tap out before you even get in. <laughs> because it's God that justifies. Listen, wait, it's God that's the boss. It's God that judges. 
So if God's the boss and God's judges, then why would I worry about anything down here or anybody that's talking about me or coming against me? How could they possibly have any kind of effect on my life? If God is for me, who in the world could be against us tonight? Who is he that condemns you? It is Christ that died for you. Yes, rather, he is risen again for you. Who is even at the right hand of God. And here he goes. And he makes intercession for you. The Holy Ghost in you praying. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. At the right hand of God, the Father interceding for you. Both of them are praying the will and the purpose of God for you. Nothing. Nobody. Not anything can take you out if God be for you who could be against you I am more because of God in my life so who shall separate you from the love of Jesus Christ shall tribulation will your little struggles separate you from God a little pain a little suffering here Will some kind of stress in your life, will you, will you have ulcers in your stomach because of the great pressure of this life and the people that are attacking you? Maybe. Shall persecution, shall some kind of lack like a famine? Shall that separate you? Shall nakedness, this was nakedness where there was no ability for you. You were so poor and you were in such an environment where there was no way that you could get clothes and you were naked. Shall nakedness separate you from God? Listen, will your clothes separate you from God? So if somebody comes in this church dirty... Some woman comes in and she don't know how to dress yet, a little low cut. Men, you better keep your eye, but you better. <laughs> you got to do what Job did. I have made a covenant with my eyes, lest I should look upon a young handmaid. I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna look upon that gorgeous thing, especially with that low cut, tight pants she's got. I refuse. But let me ask you something: Should that separate her from the love of God? It shouldn't separate us from the love of us either. What about a man that's been working all day to provide for his household and he's dirty and he needs to come to church but he doesn't have time to go home to get a shower and he wants to come to church. Can he come to church dirty? Would that separate him from God? Because here's what the scripture says. It says that who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall nakedness, shall peril, some kind of danger? Will the sword separate us? Listen, if I'm headed to the guillotine to get my head cut off for Jesus, will that separate me from God? If somebody pulls a gun on me, will that separate me? For it is written, for your sake, you're killed all the day long. You're counted as a sheep to the slaughter. Nay, no, in all these things, no matter what we walk through in this life. Wait, where is God? Where is God? Why am I facing the sword? Why are people persecuting me at work? Why are people talking about me behind my back, gossiping and whispering? Why? I'm a Christian. I'm born again. I'm full of the Holy Ghost. I got God in living in me. I'm the temple of the Holy Ghost, which lives in me. 
So how in the world then would the favor and the blessing of God upon my life? Am I facing nakedness? Am I facing peril? Am I facing the sword? How is it that I'm facing these things in life? Do, do, do sometimes in life we go through hardships? Yes. Does it all the time mean that every time, every day is going to be roses for us? That some kind of way that we're exempt from going through things in this life? It doesn't mean that. Does it mean that, that, that God didn't love me because I got raped and sodomized? Then why did it happen? Where is God? He really loved me. She says he was with me the whole time. Then why would God allow something so perverted and wicked to happen to me? Why am I slayed all the day long like a sheep to the slaughter? And it's for my sake. How in the world is this terrible evil working for my good? Testimony? Strengthen? Closer to Jesus? The pervert got me closer? Why did Jeannie Sinclair have cancer and go through 30 radiation treatments and 30 chemo treatments? Why did I end up in prison? What in the heck? Oh, 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 yeah, I know what you say. Oh, for your for your good. Yeah. Yeah, it was for your sake. Oh yeah, everyone. Hey, I could look at it like that. I could get better. Or bitter. Come on, Bishop, you gotta work. I could look at it in a negative sense. I could not be grateful. I could not be thankful. I could have a victim mentality and say that 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 I'm I've got a losing hand in life. God's dealt me a bad hand in life. My parents wasn't there for me. I was hurt all my life. They gave me dope when I was six, and now I'm on dope. Man, I could make all the excuses in the world. Or I can just say, God, I don't understand everything that I've walked through. But I tell you this, Lord, you see this old body here? When it comes to you, I give all of me to you. I trust. I, though you slay me, I will yet serve you, O oh great God. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't care what happens to me in this life. I will never not serve you. I will love you with all my heart. You serve God with that kind of heart. And you watch and see what happens to your enemies. Because the Lord will take care of your enemies. He says, all vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. I just need you to learn how to trust me in life. I need you, I need you to serve me for my face, not for what I can do for you. You got to serve me. You got to love me. You got to love me more than the stuff. You can't serve God because he's just a healer. You can't serve God because, because he's a sugar daddy. You can't give to God because he's a slot machine. Going down to the boat. Oh, let's see. Give God 20 and I'm going to get 40 back. That one-armored bandit will let you ching, ching. That one-armored bandit. (laughs) 
you, you go, king, you pull that one arm at bam. They might as well put a mask on that handle. <laughs> the bandit. Ching, ching. Give me more. I want more. <laughs> Guys, we got to love God and serve God because he's God. You, you can't serve God for what he can do for you or what he'll give you. If you're approaching God like that, man, you still got selfishness in your heart. You're still greedy. Man, God is trying to get that out of you. He might have let a little something happen to you to deal with that. Ask Job. The heck happened to Job? Oh, have you seen Job, my servant? God says, the devil said, yeah, I've seen him. Yeah, he's serving you for your face, uh, for your hand, all that you've given him, all you've done. He's the most richest man in the East. I guess he is serving you. He don't really serve you because you're God. He serves you because you're a sugar daddy. The devil says, sugar, sugar daddy. Yeah. But I tell you what, God. (laughs) Yeah, you let me have his stuff. And he'll curse you to your face. God said, oh, yeah. And the devil, why, yeah. (laughs) And God thinks about it and he says, yeah. He does have a little character defect on the inside of him that I can see. But nobody else can see it but me. But I know how to help him. How many know God knows how to help you? I mean, saying, God, I don't know if I need all your help. (laughs) And the Lord says, all that he has is yours. Only don't take his life. And the devil took everything that Job had. He ended up taking his health. He took his wealth. He took his kids. Took them out. Lost all of his family. This is tough God business. I hate it when God bets the devil and I'm the one he's betting on. And finally his wife one day says, after she'd gone through all that she went through, and I don't blame her, man. God bless her. She don't even know what's happening. She's in the twilight zone, man. She was living up here and the next day she's in a tent or something. And her husband has got boils from head to toe. He's very ugly. She's lost everything, her kids, her wealth, her house. She's lost everything. Even her husband is in twilight. And she says, do you still hold your integrity to God? Job says, you speak like a foolish woman. She says, why don't you curse God and die? I wonder where she got that from. The devil had told the devil had told God that I will make Job curse you to to his face and here comes your best friend your partner in life your married wife and she tells you to do what the devil said he would make you do. How many of you know that you got to serve God because he's God and for no other reason? He said, for I'm persuaded that neither death nor life. How many of you know that not even death can separate us from the love of God? You can't threaten me with the guillotine. You can't threaten me with prison. You can't threaten me with anything in this world because my God has authority and power over all the powers that are here. He's the ruler. He's God. 
So death can't even separate me. Nowhere in life, no matter what I get or what I don't have, can't separate me. No angel, no devil or principality or power, no thing present, no things to come can separate me from the authority and the love of God. There's only one person who can separate me from God, and that's me. That's me. Am I... Oh, yeah, and your thoughts. <laughs> he says, nor height, nor death, and I'm circling the airport, nor anything shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Hey, if you believe that, say amen. amen. And stand to your feet and let me bless you as we go out of this place tonight. Look in your handout, there's uh, the last A through F right there. Here's the conclusion then from these scriptures tonight. The conclusion is, is that God is for us. Can you say that? God freely gives us all things. Can you, can you say amen? amen? Christ and the Holy Spirit are our intercessors. Can you say amen? Amen. Nothing, not anyone can separate us from Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And we are more, I am more, be, because we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. I am more. Father, I thank you so much for the greatest people in the entire world. It's so wonderful, Lord, to look at your word and be together with the family of God that you've given us here at Miracle Place Church. God, our whole goal is the Jesus experience. So God, say with me, say the Jesus experience. My DNA, my goal is to give every person in my life, my marriage, my children, work in the marketplace everywhere I go Jesus experience everywhere we go it's all about the Jesus experience Miracle Place Church family is all about one thing that is our goal in life our mission is everywhere we go Every person we touch, we give them the Jesus experience. Now listen, y'all are going to hear me say that millions of times. Because that is our goal here. And, And I want you to hear it and get it in your heart so that everywhere you go, you're always thinking, when I got to deal with this hard deal in my marriage... I got to give my wife the Jesus experience. When I have to deal with something in the staff here in the back, somebody that has a character defect, I can't blow them out. I got to give them the Jesus experience. What I do has to be Jesus because we are his church. We are his family. And the goal of this family is to make sure every person experiences Jesus everywhere we go. On TV, the Jesus experience. So now, Lord, anoint us with your presence so that everywhere we go, every person we touch, we give them the Jesus experience. They literally experience your presence and your power, Lord. And I thank you, Father God, that you're doing that. Say with me. Say, Jesus, Jesus. you are Lord of my life. I ask you to forgive me. Come live in my heart. Change me in the name of Jesus. Come on, give God glory in this place. Have a great, 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 great night. We love you. We bless you.